Welcome to the seventh and final episode in a legendarium series about the English Civil War. In this installment, A King on Trial, we will talk about how the army forced Parliament to put King Charles on trial and eventually execute him. The driving force for the execution of King Charles was Oliver Cromwell, the commander of the New Model Army, who decided to rid England not only of its king, but of the monarchy itself. In his words, he would cut off the king's head with the crown upon it. Since Cromwell did not have the votes in Parliament to pass such a radical measure, he voted with his firearms. After years of fighting a war for the rights of Parliament, Cromwell used the army to expel all but 60 Puritans from Parliament who, not surprisingly, voted to put King Charles I on trial. Of the 135 judges summoned to hear the case, only 68 showed up. These men did not want to be part of a revolution, and they certainly did not want to be part of a trial that might make them targets for a restored monarchy in years to come. Indeed, John Bradshaw, the Chief Justice of King Charles' trial, wore a special hat with metal shields inside it in case he was attacked by a disgruntled royalist. New Model Army soldiers packed the hall both to stop King Charles from escaping and to frighten the judges into passing what the soldiers considered to be the correct verdict. The public was not allowed in to witness the trial, and this only fed the belief that Parliament's case against King Charles was weak and that this was simply a mock trial with the verdict a foregone conclusion. Yet King Charles did not help himself by refusing to recognize the court as legal, he declined to defend himself, and he even refused to take off his hat out of respect for the judges present. This only reminded all those present that King Charles would never accept a constitutional monarchy. Seven days later, the court handed down its verdict, guilty. The punishment, execution. Only then did King Charles agree to speak in his defense. The court told him that he was simply too late. And even now, only a little over half of Oliver Cromwell's hand-picked rump parliament voted for execution, a sign of how unpopular the execution was even among some of the victorious rebels. On January 30th, 1649, King Charles showed dignity often lacking during his reign. He took a final stroll in St. James Park with his pet dog. He then took a final meal of bread and wine. So that people would not think he trembled as he shivered in the cold, he wore two shirts. The execution was scheduled for 8 a.m., yet it was delayed until 2 p.m. so that Parliament could hastily pass a bill which effectively outlawed the monarchy after the execution of King Charles I. The execution would be carried out on scaffolding built outside the banqueting hall of Whitehall Palace. People filled the streets, they sat on roofs and chimneys, and stuck their heads through windows so that they could see the death of King Charles. People either hailed the death of a tyrant or mourned the murder of a king. From the scaffold, no doubt thinking about his son, also named Charles, and the future of the monarchy, King Charles gave a speech in which he insisted upon his innocence, forgave his enemies, affirmed his belief in God, and declared that he died a Christian. He then passed a five-pound gold piece to his executioner. The two men who would behead him wore masks and false beards, also out of the fear that they too would be targeted for revenge killings should the monarchy ever retake power. King Charles knelt at the chopping block, 
prayed, and then held out his hands in a signal that he was ready. When the king's head fell to the floor, a terrible groan arose from the crowd, and the executioner held up the severed head of King Charles and proclaimed, Behold, the head of a traitor. Yet few in England seem to have felt as strongly about the abolition of the monarchy as Oliver Cromwell. Indeed, to many English subjects, King Charles became a martyr who died because of the sins of his disobedient and unruly subjects. Oliver Cromwell, after years of fighting for the rights of Parliament, simply took power as an effective military dictator. Less than a year after Cromwell's death, the monarchy was restored. Yet the English monarchy would never be the same. Never again would a king try to achieve the kind of power that King Charles I had, and Parliament remained firmly in the driver's seat. And that is the ultimate legacy of the English Civil War. I hope you enjoyed this Legendarium series. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.